Now we're talking about to get peace, we're going to capitulate yet again. If we do that, bad behavior is rewarded, bad behavior is rewarded, bad behavior is rewarded a third time, there will be more bad behavior. The lack of F-16s or comparable Western fighter jets was often cited as one of the key things that um, limited the counteroffensive of 2023, that this was a key capability that Ukraine needed. Do you think that now when Ukraine finally has F-16s, they can be still used for that purpose, like a key decisive factor in liberating Ukraine's territory? Or did Russia already get too much time to adapt, to counter F-16? See, I think that this is one of the not uh, encouraging points. The F-16 is coming on so slowly because we have to train pilots. We have only a certain amount of F-16s that are being introduced gradually. Um, that the F-16 will have impact on today's fight, but it would not. It will not have the impact of if we had started F-16s five years ago or six years ago, and now we had a larger, mature force of F-16s, they would have a dramatic impact on today's fight. Rather, what's happening now is this capability and this impact is gonna grow slowly and gradually over time. And it's in, sadly, it's not gonna have a huge decisive impact, in my opinion, in the next couple of months, maybe even six months. But as we begin from there out to have more numbers of pilots and more numbers of airplanes, the F-16 will have a large impact on this fight. And it would have had an impact last year. By the way, everybody talks about, you know, we, they've been yelling for F-16s for a year and a half or whatever. No, that's wrong too. We identified over 10 years ago that Ukraine needed fourth generation fighters. We didn't identify what kind that would have been inappropriate. But what we needed to do over 10 years ago, and this came out of a study that, that my predecessor started and I finished as the SACUR uh, process of looking at how to help Ukraine's military be more Western. We identified these needs over 10 years ago and the world has reacted extremely slowly to supplying those needs. You were a commander of Allied Forces in Europe when occupation of Crimea happened, when the war in Donbas started. So what was the reactions? What lessons did NATO took from this aggression, if any, at the time? Good and bad lessons. The good lessons is beginning at the Wales Conference, which happened while I was the SACUR we started making big changes to NATO readiness. During the peace dividend years, during the years maybe as many as 20 after the wall fell, we were all downsizing our militaries, we were letting our readiness slip, our forces weren't exercising, flying as much as they needed, and, and so we had settled into a place where we were trying to make at least a partner out of Russia. Then Russia invaded Georgia in 2008. And even then, we sort of quickly said, oh, that's an aberration, it's only a moment in time, we'll get back to having peace with Russia, and we kept limiting more our ability to fight. And we have nations, very capable nations, that almost got away of thinking of warfare as part of what a military does. And the military became more of a peace machine and a peacetime machine. And so uh, the good news is, since 2014, starting with the Wales Conference and our summit and every summit thereafter, we have truly increased the readiness of NATO. We've increased the force sizes and structures in Europe and we are making ourselves much more ready to fight. Uh, and that's the good news. So you think that by now European NATO is ready for this kind of confrontation with an no. actor like Russia? No, but we're way more ready than we were in 2014. We have a ways to go. And the, the tough part ahead is 
because we see Russia that has demonstrated it will amass an army, march across an internationally recognized border and invade its neighbor now three times, 2008, 14, and two and a half years ago. Um, we are focused on current readiness, exercises, equipment, supplies, fixing things mechanically, getting what we own ready to fight. We're focused on that. And now we have to make the tough decision of how much money we spend on that and how much we spend on future readiness. Are we ready to fight the fight in five years or 10 years? And that's a tough decision for lawmakers to make, but that's where we are today. What are the key military lessons that NATO can take from Russia's war against Ukraine? Key military mm -hmm. lessons learned. So, so may, I, may I answer a little different question? Because I think there are lessons we do not want to learn, and there are lessons we do want to learn. Ukraine, some of the innovative ways they have developed to fight drone warfare, incredible electronic warfare capabilities, uh, these are th lessons we absolutely want to learn. But part of the reason we're learning some of these things is because traditional ways of fighting have failed. We talked about it before. The Ukrainian Air Force has done a magnificent job with what they have. But they have not been able to establish battlefield air superiority nor air superiority over their whole country, which is a Western way of war. We do create air superiority. And so we, don't, we want to remember that while drone warfare is a ne necessary way of doing this when, you're, when your traditional air capabilities fail, um, they're going to work a whole lot better if the air forces, land, air, and sea, are able to establish air superiority. The drones are going to work way better. I heard someone recently say from Ukraine they're going to buy over 1.6 million drones next year. And they would expect to lose half of those drones, 800,000, in a war. Well, if you have air superiority, you're not going to lose 800,000. You may not have to buy 1.6 million because your drones will be able to act very differently in a zone where you own the sky. And so we want to learn the lessons of EW, drone warfare, and other things that Ukraine do, does so well. But we don't want to accept that those are a replacement for the ability of the nation to own the airspace over its nation. Looking from the other side, uh, Russia has lost considerable capability in Ukraine, manpower, equipment. How soon do you think that Russia would be ready to confront such an adv adversary as NATO? It depends on how we conduct the rest of this conflict. If we now capitulate and for peace give away another huge chunk of, of Russia and reward bad behavior for a third time by giving Russia a bigger piece of Ukraine. If we were to do that and stop fighting, then Russia can immediately begin to transition to get ready for the next fight. And there will be a next fight. We rewarded bad behavior in 2008. We let them hold on to 20% of Georgia. We rewarded bad behavior in 2014 by allowing Russia to hold on to about 12 or 13% of the most important commercial parts of Ukraine. And now we're talking about to get peace, we're going to capitulate yet again and reward bad behavior now a third time by giving them more of Ukrainian land. If we do that, bad behavior is rewarded, bad behavior is rewarded, bad behavior is rewarded a third time, there will be more bad behavior. There will not be good behavior to follow that. And so keeping the pressure on means they have less ability to prepare for the next bad behavior. And I will say again, there will be a next bad behavior.